I bet you didn't know that the former CMO at Kodak was also a former MSP. Jeffrey Hazlett joins me. He's the former CMO at Kodak and now the primetime television host of the C-Suite with Jeffrey Hazlett on this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. Are you ready to unlock the power of seamless payments? Look no further than Gazinta Payments, the ultimate solution for hassle-free transactions. With Gazinta Payments, you can wave goodbye to headaches caused by strange domain names and confusing redirects. Instead, maintain your brand's integrity and enhance customer trust with a payment experience that seamlessly integrates with your own domain. So, why wait? Visit G-O-Z-Y-N-T-A dot com slash payments and discover how Gazinta Payments can transform your business. Jeffrey, I'm super excited to have you on. Thanks for joining me today. Well, what a pleasure. I, I really do enjoy talking to other business entrepreneurs and leaders and, and somebody of your caliber with the broadcasting and all the podcasting you're doing. <laughs> well, thank you. It's nice of you to say. You actually come from this space. I want, to, want our listeners to know that you were actually involved with some of the early Team Logic IT franchising. Uh, yep. So you've got some context on MSPs. How long were you in that business? In about, two, I was about two, two and a half years or so. You know, I, I tend to start losing my time frames on when things were going, but it was about that. Uh, we started it from scratch. I was one of their very first franchises. We came up with the idea, said, hey, let's move into this space. And very close friends with the founders of Sir Speedy, Pip. Uh, you know, they own uh, copies now. They own a whole bunch of them and franchise services. They, they, they actually spun out of KOA, if you can believe that, went into printing <laughs> and then from printing, of course, went into the IT business, which has been very good for them. I mean, they've done very well. I know you've spoken at their convention. I've spoken at their convention a number of times. And some of my best friends in the world uh, work at Team Logic IT and, of course, all the printing franchises they own. So you get it. So let, that helps with the context, because I actually want to start with a little bit of culture stuff. You know the space, and you know this hard, and your book is the, the hero factor, how great leaders transform yeah. organizations and create winning cultures. Help me understand, what's your philosophy on building company culture, particularly in the context of services? Because you've got to balance that innovation and collaboration with structure and compliance. You know, first it comes down to the values. I think the most important thing we can do is what kind of values do we want to have as a company, right? What do we want to be when we grow up? I think that's the most important thing. And companies that really spend time on values, I tell you, so much stuff comes so much easier and faster by knowing who you want to be and what you want to be and then being able to tell other people about it. And quite frankly, we find those companies that lead with values, they gross more money, they earn more money, they have uh, ha happier employees, more engaged customers, you know, and vendors who want to do business with. So that's one piece, you know, but but culture takes a long time to develop. It does. Uh, but values help to establish that. And then the next thing I think, Dave, that's so important for business is what problem are you solving? You know, you know, really get down to what is it I'm supposed to be doing and how I'm supposed to be doing it. Because as entrepreneurs or business leaders and uh, service providers, we could be doing squirrel moments a lot, you know, like squirrel over here, over there. And, and if you get really focused in on your values, you know, the basis of who you are, that foundation, and then you start saying, hey, what problem am I solving? And you really understand what that is. It makes everything else so much easier. All right. Now we're going to make this harder. We inject remote and hybrid work. I and mean, it seems like we're kind of settling into hybrid being the one. You know, what are you saying and advising people to do to be effective when you make it even more complicated with hybrid work? Oh, well, we just talked about this this morning with my assistant. We were talking about she's getting distracted by this and this. And that happens a lot when we're, you know, in the office or we're away from the office. And one of the most important things is what I call time blocks. You find blocks of time for you to be able to work. Like, I'm going to do this, then, this, then, this, then. And by doing that, that helps you establish some, some parameters and some rules. Because if you're working in that hybrid environment, you know, you got your dog there, you got your cat walking across the desk, you got all this other stuff. Your kids might be homeschooling or something else, or, you know, the UPS guy is, uh, you know, ringing your doorbell, dropping something off from Amazon or whatever. And, you know, those things tend to distract you from the work at hand where you wouldn't have that if you were in an office environment. 
you know, the other thing, it's important for teams to connect a lot. I use a Zoom or a video platform, or maybe it's Teams, whatever. I, you got them all, like all of us. We have them all. All the conflicts, all the microphone conflicts, all the stuff that you get when it comes to all this IT that you're trying to share across the desk and different platforms. You know, and one of the things that I think is important for a lot of teams is to connect visually. If you can't be face to face, then hey, camera's on. And we make that a real thing. When you join our team meetings or company meetings, it's cameras on. And, of course, I lead a business community of 350,000 executives through the C-Suite network with C-Suite Radio, C-Suite TV, C-Suite Book Club, and all the things that we do. And we encourage people when they come into the meetings, even if we're doing a seminar, a webinar, or you know, um, some kind of mixer that we might be doing online, it's cameras on as much as possible. So it's leaning into that. I've actually even taken to rather than sometimes texting people, I actually just shoot a video and send it to them. So that I, I do. Can I've see. been doing that for years, Dave. I love that. I think it's more effective. The vision, you know, the more they can see it. And by the way, with faces like us, I mean, come on, they, it <laughs> needs to be seen. That's why we're doing TV. Anyway, I just think that's an, it's just a really good way of doing it. You're seeing more and more people use those terms or those tools like a bomb bomb video and Zoom's now built it into their feature, one of their new features that they've just come out with, or at least it's in beta. I know I get a lot of different things. I first was one of the very first enterprise customers of Zoom when Eric was operating that out of his basement. You know, and uh, early on, so I've been doing it. In fact, I'm responsible for the lead button or the exit button on Zoom. He calls that the Jeff Hazel button because I called him one day because I, I couldn't hang up the call. I couldn't figure it out. And he says, right there. I said, why don't you make it red? And the next day he called me, and this is the founder of Zoom, and said, hey, look, look, it's there. It's there. And I said, what are you talking about, Eric? And he said, look at the exit button, the leave button. And it was red. He goes, we call that the Jeff Hazel button. <laughs> well done. So how do you measure all this? How do you, what, what are the kind of metrics and KPIs to no. know that you're doing a good job with culture? Well, I, you have to, and by the way, you just said it, you have to have something to measure. You get what you measure. So what are those things that you want? Is it engagement? Is it happier employees? What are the things that you think are important? Is it, is it the fact that you're serving your customers in a certain way, if that's part of your value? So you want to be able to come up with those mutual conditions of satisfaction. So what are those for you and your employees and your team? And by laying those out, so you're gonna have to have some tough discussions around that. What's it mean to be a good culture and at the end of the year or the end of the decade? Because again, it takes time to build culture. One of the things I would strive for companies is to focus more on short term and that's mood. What's the mood of the company, the cadence of the company? You know, it used to be when you walked in, Dave, into an office or maybe, you know, I do a lot of television. So a lot of television sets or those things, you can feel the energy of the show by its cadence. Well, you can feel the energy of a business by its cadence. So what's the cadence of the business and what's the mood? Because mood will kill a lot of things in a company. If you have a bad mood in the company, it's going to be reflected in everything that you do. I mean, how many times you've been to a great restaurant, one of the best restaurants in DC, for instance, you, you're there, like, you know, like at Old Ebbets or something like that, and you go and uh, the food is fantastic, but the service is snotty and they're kind of in a bad mood and complaining. Kind of like being on an airline and listen to the flight attendants complain about their jobs when you're sitting in first class. You, know, you, you enjoy the first class experience, but they're making it a bad experience for you because of the mood. Now, how many times have you gone to a crappy, you know, maybe an Irish pub like Scallywag? Not the best pub in the world in New York City, but I love the mood. OK, I love the people and the way that they expose themselves. The food is not that great. And scotch is scotch. But nonetheless, you find yourself really gravitating to great mood. And so I would tell most businesses, you know, what's the mood of your company? Are your employees happy or you're expousing your answer the phone right? You you know, you're treating people or you are you getting back on email on, an, on a regular basis within, you know, quickly? Those are the things you want to put into those KPIs. So you've actually sort of set up really well because because mood is one of those and storytelling and all of that impression is really important as we start thinking about your other area of expertise, which is marketing. Yeah. And I want to I want to ask you, you know, somebody you've spent a lot of time thinking about marketing, working on marketing. 
where do you see that evolving for services organizations going forward? Like, can you identify the key sort of trends that we should be keeping an eye on here? All right, number one, you just said it, storytelling. Listen, you have to become a media company. I don't care if you're an IT-based company or or you're a service company or you know a, a consultant, a, a speaker, an author. It doesn't make a difference. A brand is a brand, and brand is a promise delivered. And so you have to work on what's your promise you're delivering. And in today's world, they can't just search you to find you because you can hide behind a website. You can make any website look like a billion dollar company. Now, is it a billion dollar company or is it some guy, you know, uh, you know, sitting behind a screen, eating Cocoa Puffs and drinking Diet Mountain Dew? Could be. Well, what you have to do is tell the story. So I always say things like, uh, Dave, for instance, if you're a dry cleaner in St. Louis, Missouri, there are 93 other dry cleaners in the area. How are you going to be noticed you know, better than anybody else. Well, you have to become the doctor of spots. You have to be able to tell the story of what you do. So you need to engage in social media. You need to engage in blogging, maybe even have a podcast and tell people what you do and how you do it. I would say every business today, if you really want to be where you want to be in terms of really successful, you better be doing a podcast because at least you could be interviewing the people you want to do business with, or at least telling the story of giving helpful hints every single day of how you can solve their problems. Let's get back to the doctor of spots. If that person who is that dry cleaner is sitting there going, let me tell you how to get grass out of jeans. Let me tell you how to grass stains, or let me tell you how to get blood, uh, blood stain out of a shirt, whatever it is, I'm going to tell you that. By the way, you can do this yourself, or you can call me, let me come and take care of it because I'm an expert. And that's in essence what you're doing every day. You're telling the story by giving people great information, great content. Great content leads to a great community, which is your fans and the people that want to do business with you. And then that leads to commerce. And that's the new game. So it used to be, Dave, we used to advertise and shout and vomit up information. You know, hopefully you got eyeballs and ears, but it's not about eyeballs and ears anymore. It's it's about hearts and minds because that's where the real money is and in, in getting people who want to know you want to do business with you and want to follow you because you're authentic you're real and you do a great job so in this space we were talking a lot about AI because that's going to be incredibly interesting in the marketing space I'm using interesting intentionally because I don't want to like uh, say too much on my thought on you I want to take get your take how do you think AI is going to change what we're doing in marketing it's scary it's absolutely scary what can be done. You know, I, I just did a, a meeting with a group of thought leaders and had an AI expert come in and we actually took, you know, content that you would write and say, give me a nurturing se sequence for seven letters uh, to be able to move people through from the beginning of the introduction of the service all the way through uh, buying uh, and, and different steps. And then we said, and put it now in the voice of Jeffrey Hazlett. And right before our eyes, it took those seven letters and changed them into my voice based on material that it, that it knows and sees. I was talking with Tommy Habib yesterday, Tom, and he's on my show, uh, All Business with Jeffrey Hazlett on C-Suite Radio and C-Suite TV, and he is a TV producer. And I, we talked about AI and the impact it's gonna have on acting and, and uh, commercials and everything else. I, and even let's just take speaking, public speaking. I'm a professional speaker, Hall of Fame, I can do my avatar, go and tape myself for a few minutes, and then minutes later, I can create an avatar that I can't tell the difference between me in real video versus that AI-generated avatar, feed it a script, and it now starts speaking in my voice. So there's a lot of things that we can use, good and bad, okay? Good and bad that we could do. One of the best things I think that's really great about AI is in the versioning of things in the jump starting. So every day I have a little thing, what can I use on chat GPT to help me do my job better? I, I That's on my, my Monday board, pops up every day, and I look at letters or things that I might, invitations, things like that, and I'll go to chat GPT and say, write me an invitation to attend a, a, an executive mixer in Dallas on September the 20th at such and such time and such and such time at this, at this venue, put in a flavor of the restaurant, put in a flavor of why it's important to network, and boom. It gives me back a letter. That would have taken me, what, half an hour to put, you know, put together in less than 10, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. If I count the time that I actually told GPT what to do, I get back that letter. That's where it's, that's a time savings for me. And quite frankly, let's just be clear, not a lot of IT guys are really great at marketing. 
So you can get some marketing help and marketing assistance by just going and utilizing that. So that's that's good. I, I you know another thing, Dave. Look, you put a quarter in, you get to go for a full ride here. But you know, uh, one of the other things I like is also asking it for things to do, list of things, a plan. You know, give me the top thing things I should do in order to go after new customers or whatever it might be. I think those are really great. Now, it's, it's interesting about it because I don't mind even saying, like, I use ChatGPT to prep for this, right? So that yeah. I had some thoughts. So I bounced ideas off of it and used it as a collaborative partner. And it, literally, in the one of the interviews that we just released uh, right before yours was I was talking to a voice security person who actually was talking about the fact that a, a podcaster like me, there's thousands of hours of my content that can be used for generation. You're similar, right? So you would be similar that the reason that a, a bot like this can do it in your the voice, you know, the voice of Jesse Hayes is, is that you've generated a lot of content. Do you think that that content creation skill is going to be the key differentiation for those that stand out in a world of AI, or is it, or is it going to dilute because everyone has these tools now available to them to accelerate? Well, you, you, the, the, the real differentiation's in the doing, because most people won't do it. You know, if, so the key is just do it. And these things will help people, but it will also level the field. But at the same time, you know, let's get back to Tommy Habib, the producer. Imagine that I now was asking for the flavor of Al Pacino combined with uh, De Niro to be able to create a letter or a message that says this. Well, that's the difference, right? So you, you, that's being a little bit more creative and not everybody's gonna be those creative. Not everybody's gonna do the training that you're doing with ChatGPT because there is a giving back and you can get better and better and better. The more you give, the better it, it, it gives back to you. So those are gonna be the things, but it's really, truly, Dave, most people just won't do it. And that's, that's the key thing. You know, it's, most people will succeed if they just start doing something, right? You know, putting out an email, or a newsletter, or contacting customers, or even having a list of potential customers to go after, right? Most of them won't do it. And I know that people listening, they should be doing that. That's what they should be. I know they don't. No, it's so true. I <laughs> totally. But, but I wanted to get your insight into the, the way you were thinking about that. And it sounds like your philosophy is similar to mine, which is that it's going to be an accelerant. Those people that oh. know how to use AI are yeah. going to be the ones that are the most effective versus being displaced by an API. Yeah, AI. well, and I think right now, if you're a business owner, you better get immersed on it. And that better be more than, oh, I just use chat GPT. It's going to penetrate every aspect of your business. And there are some, by the way, there are some great things that you could be doing with chat GPT or, or AI in helping even responses back to people who are asking key questions. And, you know, there's lots of bots, but imagine these AI bots that we're going to have with this that's going to allow you. And I'm sure there's going to be subscription services that the AT providers are going to, you know, those that are doing managed care are going to be able to get. Like, you know, I, I turned on my modem and it wasn't working. Like, you know, yesterday, I, my wife and I were freaking out because we couldn't get our garage door open. And so I went and got a new battery to put in the garage door open to find out that she had turned off the garage door opener switch, you know, on the side of the wall. You know, it, 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 you know, some simple, some simple questioning and, you know, walking me through steps would have fit, would save me buying a $48 battery. <laughs> so as we sort of wrap up, I, I like understanding the way successful people think. And I want to actually ask you about a career moment for you. I want to ask about Kodak. Yeah. Um, you know, so you started there in twenty in two thousand six, and you left in twenty ten. And yep. it's a great story, right? We all know the story of Kodak and their and their investments in digital cameras. It's kind of like the case study that we all talk about. But what's actually kind of interesting is is, is a student of both history and gadgets, right? The digital camera story is super interesting because nineteen seventy five is when Kodak built its prototype. Right. And then the first kind of working one was out of the University of Calgary in eighty one. And then, you know, they, they start showing up in shops in like the late 80s. And everybody forgets like Apple had one in 94. Like that, they had that, by the way, that was a Kodak camera that we licensed yeah. to Apple. That was the yeah. first, that was the really the very, very first digital camera that was commercialized. I mean, there were other ones, but they were expensive, bulky and big and and right. uh, yeah. 
Just and and it was so like so digital cameras come around in in that sort of late nineties and we come into the two thousands. Two thousand three is camera phones starting to become almost more prevalent. And of course the iPhone is two thousand seven. Now notably you started at Kodak in oh six. Right. So my question actually is is I wanna I wanna understand what was the opportunity you saw at going to Kodak in two thousand six? What 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 attracted you to that role? It's the B2B business. What's left at Kodak today is the business that I sold into Kodak for billions of dollars. You know, I bought and sold over 250 companies in my career, about 25 billion. And most of that, the, the bulk of the, the money came when I sold, helped sell companies into Kodak because they were, they were excellent, excellent at material science and imaging science. That was what they were really good at. You know, they would make their own, you know, grow their own cattle just to take the bones to, you know, make gelatin out of it. So they knew how to make things, right? And they knew about imaging science. And the real business and the business that's profitable today that throws billions on the bottom line is the B2B business. That's the business that I saw. That's where I went. I happen to have you know, pick up the com the uh, the commercial business, the consumer business as well, because that was part of the job. So I had both of those. So we saw the opportunity. I also thought that this could be a company that I might could run someday because I just love legacy companies. I was from the printing industry. Um, you know, that's how I got into Team Logic IT because they ran printing franchises. I knew them well. And then they said, hey, we got this other business. So that's a great business. I want in on that business. That's the future, you know, remote diag and diagnostics, servicing people from a desktop, sitting in a room, watching over thousands of computers. That's going to be the future. Yes, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. Um, and so, um, but I had to, by the way, give those up when I went to Kodak. But, and also the other thing is they, listen, I was stepping into a Fortune 100 company. It's the most elite job there is in the world. There are only, let's say, five officers per company, Fortune 100, 500 people. Let's just take Fortune 1,000. There's 5,000 people. There are more people playing professional football than Fortune 1,000 officers. It's a very elite community. It's a heady thing. It's the Super Bowl of business to be able to do it. That play at that level. I got to play at that level. I left a you know, owning a, a, a Team Logic IT business and having a little PR firm of three people to managing a budget of $17 billion in marketing, $182 billion in sales, 100 plus thousand employees, and, and a chance to help turn around a company. That was what that was all about. Well, that explains it. That gives me the insight I was looking for. Jeffrey, this has been fascinating. Really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. If people are looking to get in, get in touch and learn more, what's a great resource to point them at? Just anything on social media, look at hazlet.com, H-A-Y-Z-L-E-T-T.com, or c-sweetnetwork.com, but you can find me on social media anywhere. Well, there we go. Jeffrey, thanks for joining me today. Thank you. Partner Hero is an outsourcing company that goes beyond industry norms to prioritize employee empowerment, career growth, and quality performance. They pay above market salaries and have a management team that includes individuals from the startup world making them more than just a service provider. They're also a thought partner for startups. With flexible terms to let you scale quickly and offices around the world for global coverage, you get a thought partner for your business with quality assurance baked into every program. You know I believe in outsourcing. It's what IT services is all about. If you're ready to bring in outside customer support help for your startup that feels like it's part of your existing team, check out Partner Hero. Head on over to partnerhero.com slash business of tech to book a free consultation with their solutions team. Mention you heard about Partner Hero from Business of Tech and they'll waive the setup fee. Thanks for your time and attention. Time is a finite resource, and I really value you giving me some of yours. If you like this video, you can let me know with a like of the video, and even more valuable, hitting the subscription button. My content is all free, and I use metrics like subscriptions to pay the bills, so it has real value. The content here is produced under ethics guidelines, posted at businessof.tech. If you're interested in more content like this, you can get access to content early via our Patreon at patreon.com slash MSP radio. It's our give what you want model where you set the value of what you think the content is worth.
If you like this podcast, you can catch it daily as the five-minute news and commentary show, The Business of Tech, available on all your favorite podcatchers with links at businessof.tech. Just hit that big blue button to subscribe. Again, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen, and I really value the interaction. If you want to say something in the comments, I do respond and watch all that, and I look forward to talking to you next time.